Unlike on modern roads, in World War II, the cyclists hit you. In all seriousness, bicycles were employed in many theatres throughout the war by both Allied and Axis infantry units, and to varying effect. The Japanese, however, managed to make bicycles terrifying, riding upon their enemies with bare metal rims and scaring them half to death before they had even started firing their guns. Slap on your spandex and get ready to flip off the car behind you because in this video, we're pedaling alongside Japanese bicycle infantry units into the Second World War. Before we get into Japan's use of bicycles in the war, we have to ask the question, why would a military choose a bicycle over two legs, something with four legs, or something that runs on combustible fuel? Well, the answer to that is pretty simple. Bicycles are relatively cheap to produce, maintain, and propel, relatively easy to transport before deployment, and suited to a wide variety of terrains. Due to their size, bicycles don't need the clearance that, say, a jeep might need, making them decent on narrow and unpaved tracks. They can also be lifted over difficult terrain, such as through a shallow water body, and cyclists can also take a break by walking alongside their two-wheeled companion. In his book, Japanese Army in World War II, The South Pacific and New Guinea, 1942-43, Gordon L. Rotman wrote, Japanese troops would walk beside their bicycles for a short time each hour to exercise different leg muscles to prolong their endurance. Bikes are also decent at lugging equipment. In the jungle theatres of the Second World War, for instance, each Japanese infantry cyclist carried some 36 kilograms of gear, including five days rations. Each British infantryman, on the other hand, carried only 18 kilos of gear. Lastly, bicycles are relatively quiet and fast, with early Japanese infantry units being capable of maintaining speeds of 16 to 24 kilometers per hour when necessary. Unlike horses and jeeps, bicycles are incapable of experiencing fear and psychological trauma as well. Of course, bicycles have their limitations too. While it might be cheaper to maintain a bicycle than a car, bicycles are still prone to damage and wear, and upkeep still takes resources and time. They also suck without inflated tires, or worse, without any tires at all. Firing a gun to any actual effect is difficult on a bike as well, and they offer just about zero protection as opposed to a truck, tank, or dragon square shield. Lastly, I can feel my butt aching just thinking about sitting on a bike, let alone riding it for days or weeks or months through the jungles of the Second World War. So, to what extent did the Japanese use bicycles during the war, and why were Japanese bicycle infantry units so terrifying? While Japan's use of bikes in its 1941 invasion of Malaya gets most of the spotlight, the Japanese were on two wheels long before the Second World War, including as far back as the mid-1920s, and also in the Second Sino-Japanese War. During Japan's 1937 invasion of China, for instance, it's estimated that the nation deployed as many as 50,000 bicycle infantrymen. Back to World War II, they were deployed elsewhere in the Southeast Asian theater, including in French Indochina, the Dutch East Indies, and the Philippines. As per Japanese Colonel Maobu Tsuji's book, Japan's Greatest Victory, Britain's Worst Defeat, Capture and Fall of Singapore 1942, the horses of the 5th and 18th Divisions of the 25th Army, which had been fighting in China, had become as well trained as their masters. When it was decided to use these units in the south, however, motor vehicles and bicycles were substituted for the horses. All who did not ride with the trucks rode bicycles. A division was equipped with roughly 500 motor vehicles and 6,000 bicycles. As a sort of side note, this quote basically dispels the myth that the Japanese commandeered bicycles from local populations, at least to any significant degree. They were evidently equipped with them prior to deployment, and the confusion may have come from the fact that, also according to Tsuji, the Japanese cyclists had Malayan, Chinese, and Indian locals carry their dismounted bicycles up to the front lines when they were ready to remount them and advance. 
And it was exactly the Japanese 5th and 18th divisions which fought in the December 1941 Japanese invasion of Malaya and subsequent Malayan campaign, which was a disaster for the Allies, ultimately costing them Singapore, and a massive victory for Imperial Japan. As written in US Navy Reserve Lieutenant Commander Alan C. Hedrick's paper, Bicycle Blitzkrieg, influenced by the intense heat and impassable jungle, the Japanese used bicycles rather than horses. This allowed them to travel farther, faster and with less fatigue. Due to the vast number of rivers on the Malay Peninsula and the British destroying more than 250 bridges during their retreat, bicycles allowed them to continue their advance, wading across the rivers carrying their bicycles on their shoulders. The British could not escape them. They were overtaken, driven off the paved roads into the jungle and forced to surrender. The constant pressure and relentless pursuit was psychologically devastating to the defenders, a true blitzkrieg, Japanese style. The aforementioned Colonel Masanobu Tsuji supported Hedrick's claim stating, even the long-legged Englishman could not escape our troops on bicycles. Hedrick also argued, however, that the success of Japanese in Malaya was largely the result of British unpreparedness and inexperience, with their forces comprised primarily of Indian infantrymen under British officers incapable of communicating with their men and thus unable to inspire and command them. Either way, and despite their success, the campaign wasn't entirely a ride in the park for the Japanese. To abuse our buddy Tsuji, he wrote, the greatest difficulty encountered was the excessive heat, owing to which the tires punctured easily. A bicycle repair squad was attached to every company, repairing about 20 machines a day. When time was pressing, the bicycles were ridden on the rims. When they were passing along a road, they made a noise resembling that of tanks. Tsuji also went on to say that, under the veil of night, British troops would often flee upon hearing this rattling, rolling cacophony advancing toward them. Beyond punctured tyres, Japanese bicycle infantrymen were also just straight up outplayed by their opponents on more occasions than one. On the 14th of January 1942, for instance, the Australian 2-30th Battalion of the 27th Brigade blew up a bridge while a column of Japanese troops were crossing it, sending as many as 150 troops and many of their bicycles into the gorge below before opening fire on the rest of the unit and killing hundreds of them in this stage of the battle alone. While not in Malaya, some 300 Japanese bicycle infantrymen were riding the central Luzon plain in the Philippines near the end of 1941 when they were hit by American armor and Filipino infantry. Taking heavy fire while they tried to turn their bikes to flee, 250 Japanese became casualties with deaths accounting for all but a few of that number. But what do you think? Would you soil your jocks at the sound of a thousand naked bicycle rims rattling down the street toward you? Can you think of any other examples in which the Japanese used bicycle infantrymen to effect? Would you like to learn more about the bicycle infantry units of any other World War II belligerent nation? Let us know all of this in the comment section below because you know we love reading and responding to your comments. And just before you yeet off to the next suggested video, be sure to check out the links in the description below including our new channel, The Braved, where we go further back into history and talk about badasses from all different eras and times. So if that sounds like it's right up your alley, go check that out, first link in the description below. And if you wanna check out the music we use in some of our videos here on the front, check out our Relax Jack music channel as well, where we post four tracks a month. And if you just wanna join our wider community, check us out on our Instagram, Facebook, and front Discord communities all platforms with their own exclusive content that you won't find on this channel. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.